Welcome to Watch Symposium. I'm Austin, and let's do a wristwatch check first. No surprise, wearing the 14060 no-date sub. Really enjoying the watch, and especially the tritium. You know, from the way I talk about tritium, you'd think I hated this stuff. I actually love it, okay? The one problem with it is when it comes to servicing your watches at RSC, they don't have any more of it, so you can lose your tritium. You can't get more of it, and so that makes servicing a little bit tricky but it's beautiful stuff and you know if I didn't know better I would think it was a living material because it's always slightly changing it's it's moving very slowly it kind of puffs up at times uh, it kind of goes in different directions and and uh, of course it changes color as well it's almost it reminds me of coral in a way and I can't tell you how interesting it is to get a loop and just to sink down into the dial and look at the hands and the indices it's a an eggshell color and it's an eggshell texture and it looks different than it did five years ago it'll look different five years from now and ten years from now and it's wonderful to observe and uh, so I actually really like tritium and uh, yeah I'm enjoying it so much I'm, I'm actually thinking hmm you know another tritium watch you guys know how I love GMTs and so a tritium GMT doesn't sound so crazy right now I just have to find an independent to depend on and, and uh, yeah but uh, really appreciating it all right so this is a paid video for Captain Danny all right he writes do you think Rolex should create a vintage model I know it's been done and it's been overdone by other watch brands but it could be very nicely done with restraint. I'm not talking full vintage, but maybe some vintage cues from the 70s or 80s, where it's obviously a vintage design, but with a new movement. So if you were the chief of design at Rolex, which kind of reference would you like to see redone? Very interesting question, Danny, thank you. And uh, we'll save the big question for last do you think Rolex should create a vintage model okay well let's just break down some of the smaller points he says I know it's been done and it's been overdone by other watch brands that it has it's been downright abused by other brands and I'm looking at you Omega you know many brands will take their iconic watches and try to squeeze and wring every last dollar out of them by coming up with different subtle design variations, different uh, little functions within it, um, different different colors. And the Speedmaster is a great example of that. And it's what happens when you have a, a company that is uh, out to make money, which most companies are, and, and, and uh, the number one incentive is profit. And you can love a watch and you can love a model, but you can hate a company. And I think that's how I feel about the Speedmaster. I think it's a fantastic looking watch. It's, it's beautiful. I'm, I'm not much for busy dials, but they do it beautifully. And it's probably one of the best looking chronographs out there. But the way Omega treats it and pimps it, uh, leaves a bad taste in my mouth. And, um, and what it does is it really dilutes exactly what that model is. What, what is a Speedmaster? Now, of course, we'd probably look to the 42 millimeter acrylic crystal manual wind Speedmaster, but there's so many different variations that fall under that moniker. Uh, the word Speedmaster kind of loses something. And thankfully, Rolex has never gone that route. And it's one of the benefits of them being a a trust and a charity and you know they're not uh, looking to make a buck you know they're looking much more long term than that and they want to protect the brand and they want to protect the models that make up the brand and so if you love the models and you love value retention and sustained desirability well you and Rolex are on the same page and so that's kind of nice all right so Danny continues but it could be very nicely done with restraint. Well, restraint would be an absolute must, but it's a dangerous and slippery slope to start this. 
And I can't help but think of one of the Stern brothers. And this is an anecdote that comes via Archie. So uh, this is secondhand information, or third or fourth or fifth. But uh, apparently the story goes he was asked, this Stern brother, why Patek doesn't make steel Calatravas. And, and he brought up IWC and IWC switching to steel and and something along the lines of once once you go steel, you can't really go precious metal again. And I think once you go vintage and, and limited edition, it's a slippery slope. People expect it. Customers will expect it. And it just takes, uh, well, restraint. I, I would just say perhaps not even starting it's the, the best uh, course of action. But um, we'll, we'll come back to that. We'll come back to that. All right, he's saying, I'm not talking full vintage, but maybe some vintage cues from the 70s or 80s where it's obviously a vintage design with a new movement. Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about this and, you know, how, if they were to do it, how would they do it? Would you want to create basically a recreation of, of a classic, you know, sub or GMT down to the tritium? I would say no. I mean, tritium is... You know, it's fun, as I've just stated in this video, but uh, it's an inferior and, and kind of a dangerous substance. And when it comes to going full vintage, just recreating it, I, I would say that, that that they shouldn't use inferior materials, go back to uh, outdated materials or, or, or the movement. You know, a lot of people would say, and, and maybe this is, comes from a purist perspective, that, that they should try to recreate it. And I think that's... Uh, not the way I would do it. I would try to, uh, like Danny indicates, go for the design, uh, but go for modern movements, modern materials. I think that would be the way to go. So uh, we're on the same page there, Danny. But uh, vintage cues from the 70s or 80s, you know, Rolex does that. And they did it, for example, with the uh, Explorer 2 42 millimeter. They sort of borrowed from the original 1655, the 24 hour hand, you know, with the 16570 and the uh, predecessor to that, the 16550, the hour hand changed. It, it started to look like the GMT 24 hour hand. And, and so I think Rolex does do that, borrows from the past. And, and you know, they did that with the, the Milgauss second hand uh yeah so it started out that sort of lightning bolt and then it became straight in in the 70s and then uh now we get our lightning bolt back so they they do that but i think obviously danny's talking about something more you know a, a real blast of the past model um so if i was chief of design which kind of rolex would you like to see redone which which reference well the obvious choices would be the GMT or the sub. Those are the most iconic models, but you got to be careful. You don't want to screw with a classic. You can really screw it up. And, and Rolex knows that better than anybody because uh, they didn't want to touch the sub, but they wanted a version of and a variation of the sub. And hence the Yachtmaster was born. And if you look at the Yachtmaster, it's obvious. I mean, it looks basically like a, a sub with a different bezel, a, a, a platinum bezel, I'm talking about the steel uh, Yacht Master 1 here. Uh, the bracelet has polished middle links. The case is different. The case is uh, very Hydronaut-esque, actually. But it, you know, it's got the rotating bezel. I think it's not uh, unidirectional, it's bidirectional. But, but it's a sub. Okay, it's a sub. Um, the depth rating is different. But anyway, my whole point is is that they are very uh, cautious screwing with their perfect formula. And so uh, I wouldn't touch the sub. I wouldn't recreate the GMT. The current GMT is, is doing wonderfully, right? Um, but of course, it would be tempting to, to rehash. And I, I use that loaded word rehash um, the 6542 with uh, the lack of crown guards and uh, 
You know, I mean, I, I just wouldn't do that. I, I think it would be just too contrived. And I just have to say that, um, you know, if I were to do it, uh, it wouldn't be those ultra classic models. So what would I do? Well, first of all, let me just say that if, if I were on the board of Rolex, I would say uh, it's just not a good decision, okay? Uh, we don't need help selling watches. And, you know, as a customer and, and as a Rolex enthusiast, I'd love to see it. I'd love to see a, a, a white dialed sub, okay? But be careful what you ask for. I mean, that's not going to do the sub any favors. It's not going to do the brand any long-term favors. Short-term, yes. So it would be a bad decision, especially when they're having so much success as is. So if, if I was on the board of Rolex and, and it was brought up in a meeting and, and I was like the deciding factor, I'd say absolutely not. Right. It's a nuclear option. I mean, it's, it's an option that they have in their back pocket that they can whip out if they ever need a boost in sales. They don't need it right now. But to have, to, to tweak the sub would, it would break the internet, okay? It, it would just be big, okay, in the watch world. And everybody would want this new sort of return to the classic pre-ceramic, pre-ceramic size, whatever, you know, sub. I, I, I would want one, you would want one. Everybody would want one. Um, but again, it would be a slippery slope. And so the only reason I would want to do it is if they really needed to, okay? Let me just say that Rolex is a company that always looks forward, and that's why I don't think we'll ever see this. They don't want to rehash their past. They've nailed it. it they're legends. Uh, they don't need to dig up their old corpses. They, they look to the future, uh, model-wise and material-wise and movement-wise, design-wise, here we are at the board meeting and I was outvoted and, and they've decided we are going to go for a vintage model. Uh, I lost that one, but they at least say to me, well, Austin, you can choose what model you do. All right. Well, like I said, I wouldn't go for the iconic sub or GMT, which wouldn't, I wouldn't go there. I wouldn't touch it. And the date just hasn't changed much anyway. So a blast of the past there would, wouldn't be much of anything. So what would I do? I would choose the Explorer 2. All right because the Explorer 2 of the present is so different than the Explorer 2 of the past. You know, the 1655 and the 216570, 42 millimeter, is, you know, everything has changed. The size has changed, the dial color has changed. Well, you know, we, we have polar now, we have the white dial now. The markings on the dial, the hands, the way the watch functions, everything is different. And so I think that's a vintage model that would really work to bring back. And it's the perfect time because next year, 2021, is the 50th anniversary of the Explorer 2. So going back to something like a, you know, I don't want to say a reissue, but, uh, and the word limited edition is, is, is toxic so I wouldn't say that but I would I would I would release a 1655 esque model as a celebration of the anniversary I wouldn't make any statement on how many pieces they're making or whether it's a new model to retain uh, be retained in the catalog I'd keep people guessing I think uh, people would know Obviously that it's an anniversary model and that it is short-lived, so I think it would exist in the minds of many as uh, an unexpressed limited edition, which it would be, right? I wouldn't continue to make it uh, forever, but uh, the question is, uh, what would I do? Well, it would be 40 millimeters. It would uh, look like a 1655. There'd be a polar version. There'd be a black version. I would make it obviously functionally like the one six five five zero one six five seven zero meaning the uh, 24 hour hand and the hour hand local hour hand could be separated it would function like the 42 millimeter and here's the question you know they love to use green on their anniversary models would i put a green hand i mean think about that it would okay a polar one six five five with a green 24 hour hand that would look pretty cool and it definitely would differentiate it from its predecessor, you know, a true 1655. I don't know that the green hand would work on a white dialed, I'd be sorry, a black dialed uh, reissue. So on that, I might, I might keep 
the yellow, sorry, the red, what was it at the time? I think it was actually a red. You know, the 1655 came, the 24 hour hand was red, but it just faded to orange. So yeah, I, I would keep that on the black dialed version, but there would have to be some green accents on it in some way, perhaps. Yeah, that's a tough one. Maybe, um, yeah, you could put it, you, no, 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 I'd, I'd make it uniform. Okay, so a green 24 hour hand uh, on the black dial and the white dial version, but it would just pop on the polar, wouldn't it? The reissue 1655 polar dial with a green 24 hour hand. As a customer, I don't know that I'd be feeling the green as much as a, a more accurate uh, orange or, or red but it's the anniversary so so i think it, it makes sense and and it really would mark it as an unstated temporary uh addition to the catalog and wow i mean i want one i want one it doesn't even exist and i want one but um there you go will it happen i don't know uh, it shouldn't it should not yet not yet just keep keep these uh reissue options in your back pocket rolex because you might need them in the future um you don't need them now you're doing great i mean everything's going swimmingly so just keep things as is but oh as a customer yeah man blue dialed steel sub the customer in me cries out for variations on the sub but i know better i know better that's you know it's like it's like wishing your wife would get into swinging. It's like, it might seem good on paper, but really, you really wanna go down that route? Probably not, probably not. Uh, so, yeah, but a, but a blue dialed, sunburst, pre-ceramic, bezeled, uh, no date sub. Wow, God, that sounds beautiful. Um, yeah, I mean, the, the uh, I want one, but you know, if I'm working for Rolex, I'd have to put my foot down, it's just not, right but again i mean that's instant sellout piece right there instant i mean truly a sellout piece because it would mean the company's really selling out and prostituting the sub but uh but it would sell out not like they need help with it right so uh yeah anyway it makes me think about you know a a, a bluesy on uh, not a two-tone bracelet but but just a regular like bracelet, bracelet like this i don't know anyway that's that's probably odd, but uh, anyway, let me know what you think. Let Danny know what you think. First of all, should Rolex do that? Uh, my vote is no, even though I kind of would love to see it. But if they did, what would you like to see? What would be the best for the company, and what would you love to see? So what would be the best if they had to do it? Yep, the Explorer 2. Uh, but what, what does the enthusiast uh, Austin want? a blue dialed pre-ceramic sub with a sunburst blue bezel. No date sub. Oh, God, that sounds beautiful. Let me know what you think. Take care. Thanks for the question, Danny. I'll see you guys next time.